Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 130 of the American Muslim Experience, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Omar Ansari. Assalamu alaikum listeners, and assalamu alaikum Perez. How are you? I'm doing very well. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, uh, speak to our guest today. Um, when I first came across, um, you know, the new book by journalist Shahan Mufti, who is our guest, um, I was struck by the fact that not only did I have no memory of the events detailed in it, which perhaps can be understandable since I was only a few years old, but I also had no memory of hearing about these events or reading about these events. Um, in March 1977, nearly 150 people were taken hostage across three sites around the Washington, D.C. area, the headquarters of a prominent Jewish organization, the Islamic Center of Washington, and the offices of the District of Columbia government, just a couple of hundred yards away from the Carter White House. This assault led to a two-day siege of the sites. Numerous people were injured and even killed, and remains the largest ever hostage-taking on American soil, which is just mind-blowing. The events were orchestrated by a self-proclaimed Khalifa, or Caliph, of Muslims in the West, the leader of a group predominantly uh, the, of a group of consisting predominantly of Black Muslims, known as the Hanafi Muslims, a man by the name of Hamas Abdul Khalis. Uh, Hamas and the siege would implicate the in, in the process a Hollywood film about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, releasing that fateful week in March 1977, as well as the inner rivalries and conflict between Khalis's group, which included Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as its most notable member and benefactor, and the Nation of Islam, um, and even Muslim leaders in the United States and abroad. Shahan Mufti spent seven years researching the events, and he describes them in riveting detail in his new book released in November of 2022, American Caliph, The True Story of a Muslim Mystic, a Hollywood Epic, and the 1977 Siege of Washington, D.C. The book also interrogates the disparate interest uh, representing the face of Islam in America within the black American Muslim community, as well as its relationship with the influence of the burgeoning immigrant Muslim community, as well as the geopolitical machinations of political and religious actors influencing Islam in the United States. The book, quote, tracks the battle for the control of American Islam, the international politics of religion and oil, and the hour-to-hour -hour drama of a city facing a homegrown terror assault. The result is a riveting true crime story sheds new light on the disarray of the 1970s and its ongoing reverberations. God willing, God willing, inshallah, we hope to explore these issues and more over the course of our discussion today. And uh, just to do an intro on our guest, our esteemed guest, Shahan Mufti is the chair of the Department of Journalism at the University of Richmond and a former daily news reporter for the Christian Science Monitor. He's the author of The Faithful Scribe, A Story of Islam, Pakistan, Family and War, has written, and his writing has appeared in Harper's, the New York Times Magazine, Wired, Bloomberg, Business Week, The Atlantic, and The Nation, among other publications. Shahan Mufti has more than a decade, decade of experience teaching journalism, and before joining, uh, joining the University of Richmond, he taught graduate and undergraduate courses at NYU and Marymount Manhattan College. Mufti received his graduate degree in journalism from NYU and his undergrad degree from Middlebury College. He's a graduate of the United World College of the American West and is also a former Fulbright Scholar in India. Welcome, Shahan. Very nice to have you on. We're honored. Thank you for having me, Omar. It's great to be with you. It's very exciting. No, we are absolutely, uh, yeah, we are, we're, we're so thrilled to uh, not only have um, you on uh, and to talk about your background, and we'd certainly like to probably start there. Um, as our listeners know, we like to delve into the origin story, as it were, of our guests. So um, we'd love to, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. Sure. Um, so I, uh, in, my, in my first book that you just mentioned, The Faithful Scribe, I... But the prologue of that book, actually, I kind of address the reader directly and introduce myself. Uh, I'm not going to read from it, but I describe myself as 100% uh, Pakistani and 100% American in that introduction. It's a formulation that I think other people have used as well, but it, I think it works. Um, that book was about Pakistan and its relationship with the United States and Islam and its place in Pakistan. But 
anyway, as far as I was concerned, that was the right way to describe myself. I've grown up in both countries. My parents are both Pakistani, mm-hmm. Punjabi from, from Lahore. Um, they came to this country. Uh, well, my father came in the 1960s and then my mother came in the 1970s. So, and I was born here, uh, in Ohio, actually. Uh, okay. And, uh, but Midwestern yeah, boy, I act, well, hardly. <laughs> it gets complicated quickly. Yeah. No, actually, it's not complicated. I just moved back. We moved back, and my family. Okay. Was one of those uh, unusual cases, I guess, of immigrant Muslims in the country that, after a little while, decided that they belonged in Pakistan. Uh, that they were. They just. They yeah. They left. I mean, my father was in, on a tenure track professor at Ohio University. He was, this is all in the book, in my first book. Sure. Uh, but he, you know, they were on their way to be completely uh, building a life in this country. Uh, but he decided for various reasons that Pakistan was home and just took the whole family back. I had about two siblings and, and all of us went back to Pakistan when I was very little still. It, it, um, it so almost I grew feels, up in Pakistan as well. I, I was just going to say, I think every single immigrant family uh, toyed with that idea. And it was just like, <laughs> shall we? And, and they were all probably yeah. on the brink at some point. So that's yeah. that's great. It's almost, you know, in the immigrant yeah. experience, can it kind of come to be known as the myth of return. But in your case, it wasn't so much a myth or in your family's case. It was. <laughs> it was a reality. It, it was. And it was a big decision. I can't imagine, I mean, yeah. what that decision must have been like. Uh, because, you know, again, I know both places and it's not a simple decision. Um, and, but it was, it was, I mean, it defining, obviously I was little and I had no part in that decision, but defined me. Um, cause I ended up growing in Pakistan for like my formative years were in Pakistan, uh, growing up in Lahore and, uh, then Islamabad. And then, uh, that's when I, you know, uh, and then I returned to the United States. So, okay. Okay. You uh, return as I, a high school student, or as, after- I, yeah, exactly. Okay. I finished high school in this country, and then I went to college, and just you know the rest of the deal. <laughs> um, so uh, again, all described in my first book. I'm not going to go into too. No, much no, no. Yeah, that's fine. But, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm curious about your path into journalism because I mean, obviously. Right. I mean, I don't know if it holds true to your family, but certainly, you know, the immigrant, um, if I can, you know, just make, paint in broad strokes, especially from the subcontinent, you know, the urge to have the children, you know, go into medicine or engineering or maybe law. Uh, but journalism doesn't rank up uh, among the top three, certainly. So I'm, I'm curious if there was any pushback or that was sort of promoted within the family. Uh, you, you mentioned your father being in, in, in academia. Um, was that also journalism or the liberal arts? Oh no, not at all. Oh. He 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 went to med school here. Okay. Uh, at Case, Case Western Reserve. There you uh, go. And he was he was I mean he was in the med he was in the med school but he was a PhD doctor. Uh, okay. But no, I mean so he was. Yeah, I guess he was a doctor. Uh, but no, I mean again, I think uh, yeah, I think the stereotype there is some some something to that stereotype and that kind of convention of um, South Asian immigrant parents, immigrants in general, but South Asian immigrant parents um, pushing their offspring to these more stable, lucrative careers. But I didn't, I didn't really. Again, I think it was partly uh, we were in Pakistan, and uh, I think that the the space to navigate there was narrower. In any case, um, I don't know honestly what they imagined. My parents were very good about kind of not letting us all do our thing. And I, I mean, I left the country on my own to finish high school in the U S. So I guess at that point they must've let go, uh, at some level, uh, control over what I did and what I didn't, but I don't know. I mean, I, I found a very sideways way into journalism. Um, I, for the longest time didn't know I, I, my undergrad, I did, I, I was a film, major, which I guess is a little more like media. A yeah. Bit, but, right. Uh, but then, no, I changed to international po- after 9-11. I changed to international politics uh-huh. major. And and I was actually kind of down that line. I was interning in D.C. in college and and I thought I was going down the policy route. Uh, and then I got this Fulbright that you, you mentioned uh, Omar, and mm-hmm. I, I ended up in India for that. And I'd never been to India uh, even though, you know, yeah. Again, Pakistani family, India looms large. For sure. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, I was a big cricket fan. I played <laughs> as well in school. So yeah. that was fun. Uh, 
So yeah, but anyway, that's not why I went to India. But I ended up in India on a Fulbright. It was actually an Islamic civilization grant. The State Department after 9-11 had introduced these Islamic civilization grants, okay. which was part of, I guess, the State Department's way to... Well, they were, you know, um, reacting to, obviously, the, uh, to 9-11 and uh, um, the lack of understanding that Americans appreciated at some level they had of Islam and Muslim societies. But anyway, they had this um, Islamic civilization grant that I traveled on that as an American Fulbright scholar to India. And even then I was going down the policy route, but then I literally had an accident. Uh, like I fell, I, I was rock, I used rock climb a lot. Oh, wow. And, uh, uh, I fell off in India and my like fourth day in Delhi, uh, I went up climbing with this group of people I had never met <laughs> and I, uh, uh, swiftly fell off a cliff face and broke my leg, so, like multiple places, lost some bone, like oh, snapped out. Wow. Uh, and I was stuck in the hospital and then I, over the, you know, for weeks, a couple months I was bedridden, a few months I was bedridden. And I think that's, this is also in my first book, but that's in that story. I do kind of point to that moment is where I, I decided to, I started writing mm. whatever I was experiencing right. from the hospital bed and the recovery bed and meeting people who were Indian, which was just fascinating to me. Uh, again, I have India having, it was loomed large in my imagination. So yeah, that's when I started writing. Um, and I guess that's, that's really when I think I started telling stories and writing stories and started becoming a journalist. No, no, no. When you apply for a Fulbright, I mean, it, do you have to declare like an area of research or in order to even get that grant? Uh, oh yeah. You have to be pretty, you have to be pretty specific. So okay. I was there, I can tell you uh -huh. if I remember correctly, I was there for, to study the role, higher education institutions madrasas basically seminaries mm -hmm. higher ed muslim institutions played in development of a muslim nationalist identity in colonial india so fascinating I was, I, yeah. yes i was very much a policy guy at that time yeah so i was uh, affiliated with the history department at uh, jamia milia islamia which is uh, in delhi on the kind of what uh, eastern no western uh edges of of delhi I hope I have that right. But yes, it was Western edges of Delhi. Uh, old institution. Uh, oh, yeah. Even like early, early, late 19th, early 20th century. This is like Deoband uh, was the kind of big original seminary. And Darul uh, Nad Nadwa was the second one. Yeah. And Jami, and these were kind of proposing, so like opposing ways of uh, conceiving of like the colonialism and Muslim reality in under colonial rule. But Jamia was kind of trying to carve a middle path between those two. So it was an interesting place to be. But yeah. anyway, um, it, that's what I was doing ostensibly in India. I was, yeah. I was uh, studying the roots of, of, um, of Muslim Islamic nationalism in South Asia. Fascinating. Yeah, no, there's a very rich history, obviously. And you haven't even like, I mean, those are obviously two of the main um, players or actors. But then there's also like Aligarh Muslim University. There's Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and so they I all, did travel. I, went yeah. to, I traveled to Aligarh a bunch as well. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, was, I mean, yeah, it is. It's very have you you've been to India? Well, you're, you're, you're talking to two people who yeah, trace their origins from India. Um, so uh, both okay. of our parents are Hyderabadi. Um, Oh, uh, very yeah, yeah. My father, though, um, he is a graduate of Aligarh University. So Aligarh oh. loomed large in our family. Wow. Um, and uh, both of our fathers were product of, you know, the sort of Catholic school system, you know, the, the primary school system. So um, St. Yeah. So-and-so <laughs> grammar yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. yeah St. George's yeah. to be specific, but in, in uh, Hyderabad. Um, but uh, yeah, my father would later go to Aligarh. In fact, I have uh, yeah even a family connection because my father's so my grand uncle was vice chancellor uh, in the late eighties. I'm not sure when you were there, but uh, yeah. So oh the, wow! No, I was in like early two thousand. Oh yeah, no, no, he had already oh, immigrated. So your your family's Aligarh royalty. Yeah, <laughs> I like that Aligarians maybe. Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, 
Yeah, for sure. Um, and then we've had, you know, Ibrahim Musa, who's a professor um, at uh, Duke, and he's written on the madrasa, and he himself is a Nadwat al-Ulama trained, you know, scholar and kind of writes about the madrasa system in India as well. And uh, we've had him on the show. Oh, we've, there you go. Exactly. we've had graduates of Nadwa, you know, and, and, and of course, Deobandi scholars as well. But um, um, no, thank you for that background. That's really helpful. Um, I I wanted no, I mean, to. I, yeah. yeah, I should say though, I was rock climbing more. I oh. ended up rock climbing more, so I wish I knew more about this history. But I ended right. up kind of slacking. That's that. right. That's right. You I'm becoming a reporter. <laughs> <laughs> no, you say that as a as a, as a you know as, as like you went uh, you know um, like a step down, but I don't think it is at all. I mean, certainly considering, <laughs> I haven't read your first book, so I had to I I had to sort of plead the fifth on that. But uh, having read American yeah. you know Caliph, I can certainly see. Um, you know, like uh, your contribution there. And, and I just, uh, you know, I definitely, uh, as we start talking about the book, I have to say one thing. You you said you're 100% Pakistani, 100% American, and, and you gave like such quintessential examples like cricket yeah. and then rock climbing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. So, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big cricket buff too, even though I am born and raised here. But oh, really? um, yeah, I lived in India for a little yeah. bit, um, I, like in, in middle school. So I was a little younger, but took up playing cricket, not professionally or anything. But I mean, you know, that was like our afternoon activity. Um, and then I, and then I, when I come back to America, you know, then the afternoon activity became basketball. And so, um, and I'm really yeah. excited to talk about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but we'll get there. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. The, sure. He's yeah. one of the few Muslim uh, basketball players we haven't had on the show. <laughs> well, there's, I know there's yeah, more we, than a few. You've but, had others. You've had Abdul Rauf. Yeah, we've had Abdul Rauf. Yeah. We've had uh, Hakim Olajuwon. Um, so. I will say, I will say. So, uh, just kind of on a sidebar, and we'll talk about it. Yeah. When it comes to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, yeah. I grew up as a, you know, I grew up as a fan in the late '80s. For sure. And. Same. I would go down these rabbit holes. We didn't have Wikipedia back then, but just Googling or in, on, in the early internet. And I did come across this story. So oh, yeah. this is kind of like, oh. a, a, you know, closing the loop on my, that early. In fact, it was funny. My... Omar and I went on a, roll tr uh, on a road trip to LA for this exact podcast, uh, or not this specific episode, but we were down there yeah, recording. Yeah. And I had just purchased your book. And so I had it with me as my sort of weekend reading, like my reading material. And uh, I, I had left to go meet some friends and I left the hotel, I left the book in the hotel room and Omar sort of, you know, studiously thumbed through it. Yeah. And I think got through some of it and was just, uh, he was telling me how he already knew the sort of Kareem of the Jabbar connection. Um, yeah. I did not. Um, yeah. Yeah, although actually Kareem, Kareem talked about it pretty explicitly and in good detail in giant steps. I need to I watch that. Documentary. Maybe that's, may might've yeah. been that. Oh, that's, the, no, this is his book oh. in the, he came out in yeah. the 80s. I yeah, think, that's probably 80s. where uh, uh, I heard yeah. about it. It must have been. Yeah. 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 I, and he, he that was the only time, really, that he was he opened up about it. And I think mm. that was the kind of the end of the... He closed that chapter in his life in some ways, writing that. Uh, and But actually, in the HBO documentary... I was just about... Oh, the documentary. Sorry. I was just about uh, to talk about the think, HBO yeah, show. What was that called? Yeah. Uh, sorry, the HBO oh, documentary. Oh, right. Yeah, I was just going to, I don't know if you've seen it, but the HBO show, which obviously I is did. not authorized, right, authorized, but they go into that, and maybe they even, they don't name uh, uh, Hamas, um, you know, they don't name Khalis. Oh, but no, I, they do. Oh, they they, they name him. It's oh. Interesting. There's a, there is a, one of the episodes, you watch. I watched that, yeah. be, uh, because I it was, was riveting, too. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, but I was waiting to see if they would feature Hamas Khalas in it, and there was one of the episodes. Start, I don't know if you remember, but it starts with Kareem, a young man, Kareem's conversion. Yeah. Yes, yeah, young that's man right. And his entry into Islam, and the man that they show giving him the Shahada at the beginning, it's like kind of a prelude to uh, the episode, but yeah, that is Khalas. And in the credits, he's actually credited as Hamas Abdul Khalas. Oh, so he appeared, so Hamas Abdul Khalas appeared on screen in hbo um like a few months before my book came out and it's the only time yeah. that, like it's been a pop culture reference yeah. to him um so i was quite excited about that oh see i didn't stay for the end credits but i do remember the shahada scene <laughs> and everything and i and yeah. after having read your book i was like that must have been you know Khalis that they were yeah. portraying so let's talk about yeah. how, how did you first hear about this incident yeah. what was the spark that got you interested yeah, so I think like a lot of you, you Omar, you knew about it, uh, but you, I think, are in, in a minority. 
think most people that I, I've spoken to spoke to during this whole research process, which took seven years, like we we're just saying, and then people that I've met in, you know, on the book tour and doing media since it's kind of news to a lot of people. They somehow um, this event, uh, the, the largest hostage taking in American history has been, it was forgotten. And, and so I did, knew nothing about it. Um, I've, I found it to be, to be honest, I just kind of, I, I, I found it, uh, I had just finished the first book and, um, there was, uh, you know, I was just kind of, uh, uh writing, I was doing some magazine, I, I was a magazine writer for the most part after I, I quit my daily news job with the monitor and then I'd really started writing for magazines. So I, I was just writing for magazines and, and uh, it was around 2015 that I came across this uh, event. There was the, uh, you guys will remember the Charlie Hebdo shooting, uh, the mm -hmm. yeah. two gunmen in Paris. Right. The Charlie Hebdo magazine that had run this cartoons of, of yeah. Prophet Muhammad. And, and it, they, uh, that, well, that happened and it was just huge news. I was, you know, I was a journalism professor at this time. So I found myself talking about it in the classroom because it was an editorial meeting. Like these two guys walked in with uh, guns and shot half the editorial staff at Charlie Hebdo, yeah. which was just nuts. Um, that trial is still, I think, going on or has just recently concluded or something. But um, but yeah, so I, 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 I decided to write about this whole idea. for the, I wrote for the New Republic at that time a piece about about this kind of recurring thing that happens where uh, there is a, a, a portrayal, like a depiction of Muhammad in popular culture in the West, mostly negative yeah. or, uh, you know, um, and, and how that triggers something in, in Muslim emotions and psyche. And, you know, just like there's a Muslim reaction and it's a reality. It happened. And we all, you know, we all remember satanic verses and uh and you know it, the danish cartoon controversy and you know it's just yeah, we can keep you, you can keep South going Park. Right. yeah you right. can keep going yeah um, yeah and it, it was just kept it keeps happening and more and more it seemed like uh, since 2001 so anyway i found it to be a fascinating and interesting subject so i wrote about it, that a little bit and about the history of negative depictions of muhammad in pop culture in the west uh but it was during that that I came, I just, you know, I was researching that piece um, and I, I came across this passage in, in some kind, I think it was like an academic study of some kind, to be honest. And it was just like, just as we saw in the 1977 events in Washington, D.C., where 12 Muslim men took over, took uh, three locations and 150 hours. I was like, what? Uh, right. I, I just, that just, I mean, it blew, it blew me away that I didn't know about it. Uh, again, considering somebody who had, as a reporter, I had worked in South Asia, I had covered militancy, I had a deep interest in Islam, Islamic politics, Islamic militancy. I mean, these are all subjects that I considered myself somewhat uh, educated on and interested in. And it, just, it was ridiculous that I didn't know about this episode in American history, uh, Muslim history. Uh, but American history, really, in which Muslims were involved, and I, and yeah, I just kind of that was it. I was I was ready to do it right there. I just needed to figure out because you know, I, I, it was actually interesting writing that piece. I, I what my kind of what I understood uh, writing that magazine piece was that it's never really about Muhammad's image and it's never really about Muhammad's depiction. It's, there's always something else really big happening. Mm. Uh, so in, in the satanic verses and Bruce Lee's novel came out like right as the cold war was ending and we were moving into a new you know, world. Actually, it's interesting. Satanic verses was released like right around the time Al Qaeda was founded. It's really weird. Oh, wow. 89, it's, right? You know, Around 89? It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is, yeah. so while they're publishing this in the UK, uh, Osama, like the Mujahideen are gathering in Afghanistan thinking like, what's next, right? And so it's, it was a very interesting time and, and, and coincidence. Um, but then you have, uh, you know, and in the Danish cartoon controversies happening right in the second year of the Iraq war, just disastrous war. Uh, the Innocence of Muslim, that YouTube video, that the Benghazi embassy 
attack was related to or tied to mm -hmm. was coming smack in the middle of the Arab Spring. Um, it's there's always something that's mm. just you know there's something big happening always, uh, and that's that was one of the things that I suggested in that piece was that the, the Muhammad's image and this kind of conflict over his depiction is often about some major anxieties uh, that Muslims are experiencing in that moment. In my first book, I actually wrote about an episode where a Muslim, young Muslim guy murdered a Hindu publisher in colonial India, which sparked in some ways the, you know, it was right around the Khilafat movement, the movement in South Asia, anti-colonial movement in South Asia picking up. So it was just, you know, a lot that I, I could tie to. But anyway, so I, when I read this um, episode, I there was I didn't know what happened. I did, had no. It was a paragraph. Literally, all I saw was right. a paragraph. But and I didn't know the what I was going to find. But I knew whatever I was going to find was going to be big. Right. Like I had that. I had that belief that if this fits the pattern, what's going on right underneath the surface of this attack is huge. Right. And I was not wrong. <laughs> what I found was just this kind of ocean of of tension. So with your theory in mind about, you know, the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad being sort of at the backdrop of what's happening geopolitically, um, you know, uh, you in that excerpt that you excerpt that you read, there was no mention of the fact that the incident was related to a depiction of the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah, let's give let's give oh, the yeah. uh, let's give the users real quick the context because I don't Listeners, think. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did I say, user? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been I've been. Uh, well, we're we're in the tech world. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, but let's give the listeners. I was some actually gonna some context. yeah see if you. I mean, I because I know that in I think yeah, and that's a great point. I think in order to give our listeners a high level kind of brief of the incidents that we'll be covering, I you know I think your prologue really covers it well. Um, I didn't want to put you on the spot and ask you to read it, but I mean, you can certainly obviously talk about that and, and, and in broad sure. strokes, yeah, kind of tell our listeners yeah. what exactly we are talking about in American Calif. Sure, absolutely. So um, the events that I was just talking about that I came across were um, that in 1977, March 9th, as you described in your intro as well, this is about, this is the Carter administration, the Carter administration is only like two months old, not even two months old yeah january yeah, March right? inaugurated yeah, yeah january inaugurated this is early march so about 50 days yeah. um and uh there is um a, a group of muslim men uh, african-american muslim men most of them mo all of almost all of them have never left the country just, uh, uh but they are headquartered at a, at a building on 16th street the one that kareem abdul jabbar had purchased or the group, he was part of this Hanafi group that had established themselves in Washington, D.C. Uh, and they take over these three buildings in Washington, D.C. Three buildings are the B'nai B'rith, which is the uh, headquarters of the, the global headquarters of B'nai B'rith, which is the largest Jewish services organization in, in the country, oldest as well in North America, largest um, Jewish services organization in, in the country. Second location they took over was the Islamic Center which your listeners might be more familiar with, some of them. Right. And this is on Massachusetts Avenue. This was, at that time, the largest, the most important central mosque in America, as well as this kind of Islam Muslim outpost in the capital of the country. The third bu building they hit was the uh, district building. Now it's called the John Wilson Building, but it used to be called the district building. That housed the mayor of Washington, D.C., and their entire city government. Uh, so district, the D.C. had just become a self-governing uh, unit. So the DC's government was over there. And so between these three places, they took on close to 150 hostages. And most of them were at B'nai B'rith, about 100, over 100 were at B'nai B'rith. And then at the Islamic Center, there were about a dozen and the district building, there were about a dozen. And it was a violent takeover and it was time and people were killed immediately. Um, some, uh, well, some were shot. One was killed immediately uh, in the district building. But it was timed uh, very explicitly to uh, with the release of a movie, a Hollywood movie called Muhammad Messenger of God, which, again, some of your listeners might have seen. This is the huge, epic um 1970s biopic of the islamic prophet and the story of uh, the revel all the way from revelation to the 
conquest of Mecca and how Islam is established in the Arabian Peninsula in the seventh century. So uh, that biopic was produced by uh, actually a Muslim immigrant man named Mustafa Akkad, who is a second kind of major character in my book. And the story of how that film is produced is kind of this uh, um, important thread in the book. But but Khalas timed, uh, Muhammad, Hamas Abdul Khalas was the leader of the Hanafis, and he had timed this attack on Washington to with the premiere of the film in New York. Right. And uh, that is kind of, and you know, one of the first demand from the hostage takers was that the film has to be shut down, canceled, gone. Um, and uh, that is where things begin. And then they go on for another two days. Um, so Washington, D.C. downtown is kind of ground to a halt in some ways. And uh, it is just two days of uh, very, very anxious negotiation um, happening. And people are just trying to save the hostages and kind of yeah. resolve the situation peacefully. Just so fascinating that the Carter administration is sort of bookended by, you know, uh, Muslim. Isn't it? Yeah, right. Muslim yeah. hostage taking. Um, yeah. And and. The latter, the one in 1979 with, you know, the, the um, embassy in Iran, Tehran, would, would obviously live in people's imaginations. Um, however, this incident, which, and, we, we'll, and we'll get into, like, maybe one of the, like, some of the reasons why, is, uh, is often forgotten or neglected. Yeah, in terms that's, of that's, I definitely about. want to dive into that. Real quick, though, yeah. um, when you talk about the Hanafi Muslims, um, for our listeners, it'd be great to give them an idea of who these people are. Yeah. Are they are mm -hmm. they like fringe uh, in terms of their beliefs? Um, and you know, is is this is their leader? Is he like claiming certain um, uh, characteristics, mystical, mystical uh, right. you know, like like mm -hmm. a like a prophetic or, or you know, imamate or anything like that? Or maybe you can again just clarify for our listeners: to what degree are they within the fold of Sunni Islam? I, I think that's well, a great question, um, Shahan. And if you don't mind, I mean, I think it would be also um, useful for our listeners to to sort of use this as an opportunity to kind of tell us about, you know, like Hollis's story, because yeah. that also, you know, because his relationship to other proto-Islamic movements in the black community certainly play a part in what what eventually becomes the Hanafi Muslims. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think that's his, actually, I mean. I use these events and really through the book though, what this events and researching, a lot of the book is about the two days. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, that's like a bunch of the book. Right. But a lot of the beginning, you know, the setup and, and uh, is about the, this is an opportunity, it was a pretext to write about the history and place of Islam in America over yeah, the 20th century. For sure. Um, I found that part fascinating. Is, um, yeah. 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 And it was fascinating for me to research and write because I, you know, you do you have kind of snippets of understanding of what Islam in America is, where it's coming from, what it was in the 20th or 20th century, what are the gears that turn it and how it just functions. But I at least didn't have a really concrete understanding of, how do you know just like you know basic questions like uh like why was malcolm x assassinated like i found answers to those questions that i'd never heard right um and uh you know what was the relationship between black muslims and immigrant muslims and you know how what were the power dynamics between different groups of Muslims in the early 20th century, and what were the immigration patterns of Muslims, and uh, you know, and how did the Nation of Islam get started? Yeah. Uh, Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, like where did this come from? So these were like all questions that I had never, at least I had never understood, and and so it was a fa and I used this these events, the events in 1977, to kind of lead. So my main character, like you were saying, is, is Hamas Abdel Khalas, and he is born in, in 1920 uh, in Gary, Indiana. Uh, to he's, a, he's descended from slaves. His grandparents were slaves. Both his parents were from the South, um, sharecroppers, and uh, they moved north during the Great Migration. And so, and, and Khalas was born as Ernest Timothy McGee uh, in Gary, Indiana. Uh, so he is interestingly born right around when the uh, Caliphate, the Ottoman Caliphate is falling. Mm -hmm. So America's involvement in the First World War, well, whatever, the First World War is ending, winding down, and the Caliphate is, is disappearing. 
uh, nothing. I mean, that's not something that's in his universe at that time, of course. But interesting, right. like I tied tied the, the period to that. But yeah, he he is a fascinating character that I describe him like I you know he's my central character. I got to know him very well. Spent seven years getting to know him. But he uh, the contours of it. I'll give you the contours of his life. Is basically he joined he in the army, uh, the U.S. Army during World War II. In fact, that's where our readers are like, that's where the reader meets him. He's right. Yes. He's being so you, yeah, exactly. evaluated psychiatrically. Yeah. Yes. So we meet uh, my main character at the beginning of the book. He's being, he's going undergoing a psychiatric evaluation at an army base because he's, he's about to get deployed to, to Europe with his uh, division. And uh, he, he wants, he, well, it's a question of whether he wants out or he's being kicked out. But yes, he's he, there are questions about his sanity and his mental health, and yeah. his mental situation and condition. So anyway, he's ejected from the long story short. He's, he's ejected from the army and then goes on to become a pretty successful jazz musician. Uh, and he moves to Harlem and the Harlem scene is just kicking in the 1940s is what I mean. It's just amazing yeah. to read about this. Right. But. That jazz, like the jazz scene is basically, you know, if they're, you know, Islam and Muslims oh, yeah. Yeah. are just, it's stylish and it is, it is really, you know, it's trendy. And, and real quick, Muslim and, and, yeah. you're talking about, so, so I don't think a lot of our, the listeners would know that. So how early yeah. do Islam and Harlem jazz intersect? Yeah. See, that's interesting. So. Uh, around this time, bebop is where it picks up. Yep. Um, and so as bebop is developing in the, in the 40s, 50s is where really Islam is becoming in high gear. But I do trade, you know, by the time he is, Khalas is, yeah. So it is uh, at this time, you know, I, I, Ebony Magazine, I, I kind of quote this piece from Ebony Magazine, which I think appeared in the early 1950s. And they did a whole feature, uh, I think it was 51, 52. And it was about, uh, you know, how Mohammedan religion is, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, has great appeal to to black musicians. And it, it features this one musician, Lynn Hope, who's a saxophonist. And they do a whole feature, like several pages spread. And and at that time, I don't know what number they put, like hundreds, the number at hundreds of uh, African-American non black men are, are Muslim. Yeah. And, um, and we're talking think, na I, Nation of Islam, right? Oh, no, well, I think it's a hodgepodge. That, yeah. Yeah. Because it's a fascinating mix. Right. Because uh, you have you have, you know, you have Ahmadiyya Islam making its inroads into the absolutely. black community. You have offshoots yeah. of the nation also like the five percenters mm -hmm. and, and and so on. So it's it's a really yeah, Art, Art Blakey. Art Blakey was Ahmadi. Uh, yeah. Talib Daoud and uh, Dizzy Gillespie. Well, Dizzy Gillespie was Baha'i. I think, but Talib Daoud and uh, Art Blakey uh, were, you know, I think they were running a Muslim or brotherhood organization out of their yeah. apartment. Charlie Parker. Yeah. So, I mean, these, there's a lot of Muslims in, yeah. in jazz scene in, in Harlem, well, all over the country in the 1950s. But, and it's all kinds of Muslims. It's, and there are, there's, Sunni Islam has come in through a lot of African Asian immigrants at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, the doors have not been open yet fully. So I describe in the West, you know, Harlem, the Bengali Muslim community, the Bengali Harlem, developing at that around that time as well. Which is, you know, there are some scholars who've written books on on that. Um, Vivek Bald actually at MIT wrote a book on Bengali Harlem, which was a fascinating read. But um, Bengali immigrants from Eastern, the colony of British colony of India, are moving to just jumping ship basically in New York and developing this community. And then, so they're bringing in Sunni Islam a little bit, but there's also, you know, the. Um, you know, there's just, there's, you know, the more science temple. Yeah, of uh, course. And, How could yeah, I forget? And, uh, yeah, and so it is is it was already that was in the early twentieth century, but that was kind of dying out. And yeah. then, of course, there's the Nation of Islam as well, mm -hmm. uh, and they are Temple Number Seven, uh, which is where Khalis, my main character, actually ends up in Temple Number Seven. So he's yeah. one character who does go the Nation of Islam around. You know, I'd be and, remiss if I didn't and, mention when we talk about jazz musicians. I mean, you know, there are there, and, and I've heard from pretty legitimate sources that John Coltrane, you know, and his relationship to Islam. 
you know, Allah his Supreme. Allah, Allah Supreme. Thank you. Right. <laughs> um, Miles Davis. Um, so these are, yeah, yeah these Every, are yeah. the major players. And so, and then also what you're describing is what's, what I think has been also commonly referred to as like the Renaissance, like the Harlem Renaissance that's taking place. Right. And jazz. Well, yeah. Being one part of it. Yeah, the Harlem Renaissance was early, and then I think okay. the kind of bebop and the jazz scene are developing. Got like, it. Soon after. I see. Okay. Uh, but the the kind of the Renaissance, Harlem Renaissance had kind of paved the way for artists to just move to mm. rooms, to Harlem. Got it. And that's where where jazz picks up. But uh, you know, and and Hollis, my my character, actually does pretty well cons considering how packed with talent Harlem is. <laughs> jazz right. in Harlem is at that time. He actually is pretty successful because he'd studied music. Uh, so he could read music and he, you know, he had skills that, that were in demand in Harlem. But anyway, he, you know, he become he actually goes on tour in Europe with a band. Um, one of the first bands to tour Europe after the war ends. Um, and uh, so, yeah, kind of, yeah. So I followed him through yeah. the jazz scene. And he is, and, I uh, mean, Hollis is just utterly fascinating because, you know, here's yeah. a person who, you know, is constantly riddled with, you know, there's, 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 um, you know, concerns or what have you about his mental health status. But on the other hand, he excels as a musician, he excels as an act, like as a student. Um, yeah. and then the way he ri raises and or rises in the ranks within the nation of Islam, once he does join, sorry for the spoiler, um, short listeners, but oh, yeah, yeah no. it, it's just all fascinating. And, and obviously yeah. his, the way he starts an organization, but sorry, I didn't mean, mean to cut, 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 cut you off. No, no, no. That's, that's exactly it is that, you know, he starts becoming, and I think that, you know, as a, you know, a black man kind of getting through college in the 1940s and fifties is in itself was like, you know, there were not a lot of them. And then he joins the nation of Islam and he's like one of a handful of people, maybe the only one in the New York temple, number seven, but definitely even in the national organization, which at that time is being led by Elijah Muhammad now. Right. Um, that is, uh, uh, you know, Khalis, got, he, yeah, he rises through the ranks really quickly. He's an operator and he's really skilled um, at, at uh, he knows the levers of power. He knows how to get through college. He knows jazz. He's a kind of really fascinating uh, individual. Um, uh, but yeah, so he does. And uh, Temple Number no. 7 is where he meets Malcolm X. And I, you know, this is something that I think is a, my uh, some one thing that I've contributed to the kind of my minutia of the story of the Nation of Islam is that I don't think it's appreciated how important a figure Khalis was in the Nation of Islam in the hmm. 1940s and 50s. Yeah. So there, one of the photographs that I included actually fascinating in the, book, in the photo <laughs> insert is uh, him, uh, Khalis, Elijah Muhammad, and Malcolm X. Right. And go, going through the FBI files and other records of the Nation of Islam, uh, and, you know, and and uh, it, it it's quite obvious that Khalis was vying for that one of the top leadership position in the organization. Again, just because of what he had, you know, college degree and, you know, and so anyway, um, he, he, he sent to, he starts working right under Elijah Muhammad in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, and he moves to Chicago and becomes his personal secretary. So that's where, you know, in the nation of Islam, it took him about two or three years to end up right there. National secretary of the nation of Islam. Temple number two was the headquarters, and that's where he was. He was became the he was managing Elijah's travel schedule. He was, you know, ghost writing stuff. People were saying for him in the newspapers. Mm. So he was one of the handful of top few people, which is also why he quickly fell out because people got very just the way later with Malcolm. Uh, yeah. the, the way Malcolm X was, you know, one of the things that was going wrong. Uh, with him was that he was getting too big and too important. Right. And the people around Elijah Muhammad didn't like that. Right. And the same thing happened with Khalis is that he, he was becoming too important and people you know, were not, you know, around uh, in the leadership positions didn't like it. So he, that's when he was ejected from the nation of Islam as well. And that, and then he falls in. So coming back to your question, Omar, you were asking the, uh, what kind of Islam was he? And that's where he kind of ends up into his final iteration of islam and it's really i had to decode it a little bit because so his teacher is um a, a bengali man um 
it's a, and again, he was a sea merchant, you know, kind of like uh, had jumped ship in New York mm-hmm. in the 1920s. And he was, uh, best I can tell, they described themselves as the, quote, prophet side of Islam, which I, which I think was a translation of Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaa. Mm-hmm. which is basically the prophet side uh, of Islam, which is a term that I think Sunni Islam can, can be used to describe Sunni Islam as opposition to Shia Islam, maybe. Yeah. But I do also know that the Brilvi Islam, which is kind of one that pick, was picking up in South Asia in the 19th century, early 20th century, also used al Sunnah wal Jamaat, or to describe that organization. And I think this Bengali man that Khalish met was Barelvi. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I've come to understand mm-hmm. and believe. Is that And Barelvi Islam, for those of your readers who are, some of your uh, your listeners may very, be very familiar with yes. this. But Barelvi Islam mixes a lot of Sufi traditions of South Asia right. and a lot of the, with the more um, traditional Sunni practices, uh, Hanif, you know, uh, most Barelvis are Hanafi subscribe to the Hanafi school out of the four schools mm-hmm. of jurisprudence. And so um, Khalis is basically subscribing to a very South Asian of Barelvi Islam, which, uh, and, and that's where it's showing up in interesting places. He's very interested in numbers, in oh. numerology, wow. in patterns, which is also interestingly, I think, feeding maybe some of the mental condition that he has is his hyper paranoia and he's seeing patterns where there may not be any but but Elvi islam also has this emphasis on numerology for sure and, you know yeah. um so anyway it's a lot, uh, but yeah so i think that he's subscribing to a very particular form but a very popular tradi- mainstream form of sunni islam that is popular in south asia but i think khalas doesn't necessarily have that nuanced understanding of global islamic you know practices as far as he's concerned, he's received through his teacher the true Islam, right? And even as opposed to yeah. the false Islam of Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. Got it. Now, now, unlike say like Elijah and, and maybe even Fard Muhammad, like you know his teacher, uh, I think it's the. Uh, the Sibur Din Rahman or something, oh, right? The Sibur Din Rahman. Yeah, yeah. He um he doesn't claim to be a prophet, right? But he does claim to be sort of a, a like a mystic or a yeah. um what's the word? I'm like a saint. Yeah, they're from the Qadriya order. Like I think oh, they're pretty much okay. squarely situating the Khalas's teacher is situating himself in the Qadriya order. Uh, so they are drawing Sufi, you know, again, but Islam can like straddle a lot of these traditions for sure. Um, so they are, yes, his, his teacher is absolutely explaining to him that his knowledge comes from an order of, of saints and scholars, Got uh, it. which, uh, and, and again, Hollis's interpretation of that is, is a separate issue, I guess. Um, but his teacher is not claiming to have any. I mean, he did claim to have mystical powers. So I went through the archives in New York Public Library, and I found his teacher, uh, the Sibuddin Rahman, it ads he had in the newspapers for, like, faith healing. So he had his, like, ad, like, oh, I have a backache, come and get your back fixed, or whatever. Right, like, right. suffering from anxi- anxious uh, right. dreams, come and get... so. And his phone number, and I could tell that I could track the phone number. It was the same guy. Wow. So, so he was making a living off yeah. faith healing, and he possessed, he claimed to possess spiritual power. Yeah, so this is a little which different. Which Khalas said he had. Th- this is a little different than like, you're talking about uh, like a Bengali man who just happens to, you know, he's, in, he's, a, he's a businessman or something, happens to also have this knowledge. This this person was actually like uh, selling it, if you will, yeah. right? Right, oh, like yeah. positioning himself as a faith healer, and, and you know, and, uh, and 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 promulgating this this these ideas, right? Yeah. So. yeah, and again, it's interesting. Not the only one in the nineteen. This is like I'm talking about the nineteen twenties, thirties when he's first moved to America. Okay, but looking at those ads in the New York papers, I mean, he was not the only one. Really? There is this again. There are these turban people, illustrations of turban people, and wow. and uh, these names, which are clearly some of them make sense, but don't some don't. I think there are some 
African Americans who have uh, taken on names that sound Arabic or Muslim. And there are some immigrants in the mix from Africa, from South Asia. Um, the South Asian immigrants are especially are speaking a lot, are good at speaking in English, which, by the way, Master Farad Muhammad, who is, you know, the man who mm -hmm. initiates the Nation of Islam For in sure. this country. Well, who is, the, you know, yeah. is, I think now the scholarship is coming around to basically accepting that he was, he was from present day Pakistan. That's Pakistan. right. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, that I, mean, I haven't heard. He was, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. So like the, well, the nation yeah. always claimed he was Asiatic. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I think like, like, like Shahan said, recent scholarship uh, indicates that he was probably from the subcontinent, most likely from the subcontinent. Hmm. Um, I don't yeah. know if you've so come Pashtun across this. Yeah. Sorry, Pashtu? Pashtun. Basically oh, Pashtun. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the stuff that I, I read and I think the stuff that's getting closest uh -huh. to identifying an actual individual in historical records is from right from Balochistan area bordering Afghanistan. This that, is that, a tangent. That's, that could be an entire fascinating Oh, no, no, talk. and you don't even, right. it doesn't just end there. I, yeah. I, I'm curious, Sean, if you've come across this in your readings about Fard Muhammad in particular, but, um, you know, I've heard accounts that, you know, because he sort of disappears towards the end of his life. Yeah. Um, but there are reports, I mean, there's actually people right here in the Bay Area who, like, stake claim to the fact that he's buried in Hayward, California. Mm. No, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and this is not I mean, just a, I, this isn't, like, hyperbole and, or, you know, this is from a very reputable source. Yeah, and, and Shahan, that's uh, about uh, about a 15-minute nor <laughs> drive north of where, oh, yeah. where we're sitting right now. Right. You guys should go do some reporting. I would love, I know, right? We need to become like uh, uh, no, but, amateur yeah. Woodward and Bernsteins. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, he, yeah, he did disappear. Um, and he was last seen in Chicago. But yes, his yeah. California, you know, there's interest, you know, he was definitely, so this story where he is from South Asia and he is Pashtun, right. he's coming from via Hong Kong, like the Pacific. Mm. He's coming. That was the route. Okay. Because Hong Kong was the territory. The British... Like you would go Calcutta, basically from South Asia, the next British place you would go to is Hong Kong. Right. And then from Hong Kong, you you could travel over the Pacific into the west coast of the United States. So a lot of South Asian immigration yeah. is happening. You know, the old Punjabi immigration. Of course, in the Central into Valley. Canada. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or I was going to say even Central Valley, yeah. California. Well, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And all the way up the coast into yeah. British Columbia. That's all happening over the Pacific as well. So, I mean, it does make sense that, I mean, Cal there is a strong California connection to Farad Muhammad. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, it's fascinating in personality. So, hey, Shahan. Yeah, so I wanted to quickly talk, uh, before we talk about the actual hostage, hostage event, there was an event with the Nation of Islam that essentially may have been the spark <laughs> that caused, that, that um, furthered the rift between... Um, Hollis and the NOI. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah. So the you no know, Hollis and uh, I think one of the more important events before that. Yeah. And I'll talk about that. But Hollis's Khal encounter with Kareem Abdul Jabbar is a really important moment. So the Hanafi movement, Hollis, uh, you know, and and his teacher to see with Dean Rahman established this, and a few others established this organization in New York. But it's kind of a drift in harlem for for a while through the 60s they're trying a lot of stuff they get into crime a little bit on the side uh and, you know try to rob banks yeah taking over some buildings this and that but it really doesn't take off until Hollis has this you know finds uh this kind of a chance encounter with Kareem Abdul Jabbar, who's a Louis Alcindor at that time. Um, he's in the Lake, he's um, UCLA. He's the star prospect, NBA prospect. And uh, he, you know, Collis, Collis had actually played in the jazz scene with his father. So uh, Kareem's father was a jazz musician in Harlem while Collis was there. And actually, they, so they knew each other. Um, and Collis, uh, met, uh, you know, got to know Kareem. Kareem threw himself into the mission. He immediately converted to Sunni Islam under, you know, the tutelage of Khalis. But that was a really important event that turned the fate of the Hanafis group. Um, and it, it's with that support that Khalis is able to, Khalis and Kareem kind of, you know, uh, they confer and they decide that they want to move the headquarters to Washington, D.C. 
And that's how the move to D.C. happens is they pick this house on 16th Street, a few miles up from the White House. Uh, like beautiful neighborhood. It still is Shepherd's Park neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that's where they purchased this property. Beautiful, gorgeous Victorian house with large, you know, footprint. And uh, they established the Hanafi Madhab Center there. That's what they call it, the Hanafi Madhab Center. Yeah. Uh, which is really Khalas and his family and his follow- uh, several of his followers. And they actually buy up a bunch of communities in the, in the Maryland suburbs to the north and, and some in, in, in Washington, D.C. So they form their community there. They basically move there. That's where Khalas really, for the first time, feels uh, settled and empowered enough to actually launch an attack on the nation of islam but not like a violent attack it really it was a it was a like proselytizing a, yeah it was a you know khalas had been had been long believed that he was in possession of the true islamic message the real islam which is what that had been given to him by tasibuddin rahman which was sunni islam and he had you know his whole life is being driven by this kind of twin is fueled by this twin energy of of a um, trying to deliver the true message of Islam, the true Islam to America, to American Muslims, and and draw, you know steer them away from the nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad. That is by far the largest Muslim organization in the country. Elijah Muhammad's like follow like just dwarfs right. anybody else at that time. Um, so a he wanted to deliver that message, which he felt an urge to. An urgency to deliver the true Islam, as his teacher had told him he has to do. But also, he kind of coveted that apex of Islamic uh, power in America. Like he wanted to be Khalifa. He want he called him. He started calling the, his followers started calling him Khalifa Hamas Abdul Khalas. Mm-hmm. So he s- saw himself as the true uh, anointed leader of who the person who should be leading American Islam. Um, and that's kind of what he conveys in the in a letter writing campaign to the Nation of Islam. All fifty something temples of the Nation of Islam start receiving these letters in 1973 from this man in Washington D.C. named Hamas Abdul Khalas, and they're basically saying, you know, the message is clear that Elijah Muhammad is a fraud, and the Nation of Islam is a lie, and all of you need to turn and submit yourself to my leadership and. I will be your leader in Islam, Sunni Islam. The Nation of Islam, at, by this time, is a massive organization, an extremely wealthy organization, probably the wealthiest African American civil rights organization in the country. Um, it's you know thousands, tens of thousands of followers all over the country, over fifty temples. Um, and with a strong underbelly of organized crime, like there is, there is some serious crimes coast to coast happening under the Nation of Islam at this time. So in California, actually, there's the zebra mur- murders, yeah. which is kind of a kill- killing spree in the 1970s that a bunch of Nation of Islam members went on, uh, killing white folks in, in California. That was a little later, but this is, um, but the real kind of center of organized crime in the nation of Islam was the Delaware Valley. Uh, so really the Pennsylvania, Philadelphia temple, yeah. Newark. So Newark is where uh, Malcolm's assassination assassins had come from. Um, people thought for a long time it was a Harlem, but you know, I think with that, that new Netflix documentary as well, it kind of makes a case that it was the Newark temple um, where the assassins came from and the whole plot kill Malcolm was hatched. But anyway, that was kind of organized crime central for the Nation of Islam. From And when Khalas writes this, starts this campaign against the Nation of Islam, it's the Philly Temple that kicks into action. And, and a bunch of uh, Nation of Islam followers, they arrive in Washington, D.C., a day before Nixon's inauguration, actually. So, oh, really? Um, yeah, it was like they couldn't find a hotel for that reason. They had to, like, drive around for the whole day looking for a hotel. But... Um, they come over uh, inauguration weekend, and uh, then the next day, it's just uh, it's the most horrific massacre, m- mass murder in Washington's history. At that time, I think probably to still this day, I don't think there has been a bigger mass murder yeah. in Washington D.C. in which these Nation of Islam temples, uh, seven or eight guys, 
enter the Hanafi Madhab Center on 16th Street and slaughter Khalas' entire family. Yeah. Um, little crisis. children, including little children. Including a nine-day-old baby mm. uh, yeah. who's a few months old, a couple of years it's old. Drowned. I mean, it's just yeah, it's, drowned. Yeah. The children were were drowned by like, it's, I don't, it was just, it was really horrific. It's stuff. horrific. It, it, it gave me like, you know, I, I got like Manson killing vibes. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's brutal. It's deranged. It, 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 it's deranged. deranged quality. And yeah. it's it's meant to send a message. And yeah. and since yeah. since you mentioned like NOI being affiliated with uh, organized crime, I'm I'm curious: is this to the leadership? Like, does it go all the way to the top? Does it, is it just at the local level? Yeah, good question. Because um, I mean, this is an organization really that question. yeah, because this is an organization that sort of prides itself as sort of like teaching you know black men, black young men and women you know, a, a, a superior moral code of conduct. Exactly. Yeah. And it was, it's kind of this binary that it's, it's, um, well, yeah, you know, that was the question that Hollis was convinced of that it did go all the way to the top. So I, that's one way of answering your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Omar, that, that Hollis was convinced that Elijah himself had called this hit. Mm. I don't believe that maybe Elijah Muhammad by this time, Elijah Muhammad is not well anyway. So I think the, yeah. That, uh, that there's a second tier. Um, and actually, I think the Philly Temple uh, minister was probably the one who did call it. Uh, but uh, he, but it, it did go up. There wasn't eight random men, foot soldiers, who walked barged into Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's house and slaughtered and, you know, carried out this yeah. massive, horrific mass murder. There was somebody calling it. But, um, you know, it's, yeah. So it's a, yeah. it's a good question how far it up went, uh, up it went. And it's a central question in, in Khalas's mind and in the book. And that's how that's what's propelling him towards the hostage taking in 1977. And what it's, we haven't talked yeah. about is where kind of immigrant Islam kind of fits in. And I and I and I, yeah. and I and I and I think that maybe a good starting point would be now, unbeknownst to me, like this was new. I did not know this, but that Elijah Muhammad actually sought funding from, you know, Muslims abroad. Namely, Gaddafi, Muammar Gaddafi, who will play a role later, of course, because he also underwrites. Well, throughout the book. Oh, throughout the book, right, right, right. Yeah. So, talk a little bit about that. So, so was that on Hamas's, uh, sorry, on Khalas's or yeah, Hamas's radar in terms of foreign funding uh, for the nation? Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, so, so that's the thing. I think that again, I mean, talking about what this story, what I'm. What does this contribute to our understanding of American Islam? Thank you. I think there is a ten. There's a tendency in America, and I don't know how wide this is, but to view um, Black Islam, African American Islamic tradition, in isolation to with the two immigrant Islamic traditions. So true. America. Yeah. And. And that's one thing, and you know, I mean, that's where my kind of interest as well, not interest in the story, but you know, one of my, I, I, when I moved to Brooklyn uh, after, I mean, it was in between stints in reporting in Pakistan, I was living in New York and, and I, I, I was living in Brooklyn and, and the closest place, mosque, uh, to me was uh, Taqwa. Um, Masjid Taqwa? Imam Saraj? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I would walk there. <laughs> so it was walking distance. Past so guest I of the would, show, huge, uh, huge... Um, I, uh, like an yeah. old friend, and and he just uh, he g got me married to my wife. So, oh wow, yeah, yeah. Oh, to, oh, talk oh, about American geez. Islam. We uh, we 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 invited Imam Sarah. Well, just because I was close friends with him, you know, I invited him to do the nikah in Houston of me and my wife. Uh, but oh, we're talking. Omar was there at the wedding, so Omar can vouch for this. We're talking hyper. Hyderabadi, like hyper, you know, I mean, traditional Hyderabadi wedding. And meanwhile, you have a black imam from like Brooklyn, you know, doing the nikah. That's so exactly, I loved it. That's amazing. <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm talking about. There you go. You there know, you go. The cultural divide there. Yeah. The there. Right. And, and for me to like, you know, I, I was attending there and it was a lot, it was really interesting for me, A, just to kind of, he, you know, be in an African American Muslim congregation. Um, I felt like I, I wasn't very good at going every week or anything, but I mean, when I went, it was it was a, a fascinating experience, and I also felt the tension a little bit. Okay. Because again, this is not long after nine eleven. Mm. Dude, looking like me, walks in, and people are thinking, "All right, who do you work for?" Right? Yeah. Because like, you right. know, there was a there's a lot of you know the FBI was 
going nuts in trap with entrapment cases. For sure. And sending yeah. it. Like, there was a lot happening. There was a lot of. And Imam Siraj was on that. the national radar, too, right? He's one of these oh, yeah. sort of quote, quote unquote unindicted co conspirators of the 1991 oh, yeah. bombing. Yeah. Uh, and I remember one thing I do remember about attending those at Taqwa uh, uh, congregation uh, Friday yeah. uh, uh, prayers was, uh, you know, he would talk to the FBI. Oh, yeah, he He'd would. Like, I know you're here. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, you know, his tapes. Like, uh, all of those from the federal yeah. agencies, I want to say this. So he would talk to them. And it yeah. was just funny, kind of. Oh, but yeah. But it also was serious. Right. But it was kind of a really ball. Z kind of approach, which you don't see an immigrant Muslim exactly do Friday prayer. That's right. right. It's like That's kind right. of for it's, sure. It's sanitized. It's a little sterile, <laughs> and it's you know what I'm saying. No, no, for so, sure, anyway. for sure. Which uh, is why, so, as young, you can imagine, as young Muslims growing up in America, we gravitated towards the kind of you know like charisma of someone like Imam Suraj. You know, and his cassette tapes of his Friday khutbas were sort of disseminated widely, sold at like national co conferences and so on. So that's how he appears on my radar, at least. Yeah. And, you know, Omar's and others like like us because we came of age, you know, um, sort of consuming those that content. Uh, but, yeah, those sterile, it, it certainly juxtaposes against the kind of standard, you know, um, if you're lucky, English khutbas, but if not, mostly yeah. Arabic khutbas if in not, yeah. immigrant mosques. Yeah, yeah, because of yeah. the, it was, and it, it, ironically it, enough, because of the quote-unquote Hanafi position about Arabic. <laughs> yeah. It's, Sorry. Uh, to me, that was yeah. kind of where it, it, I just kind of, I lived that stark uh, contrast for a little bit. But Sorry. anyway, mm -hmm. so I, what yeah. my point was that, um, we do kind of imagine these two traditions have to have been evolved independently of each other or isolated. And that's not at all the case that I was finding. So we can go back to Master Farad Muhammad, right? Yeah. Like this guy from Balochistan, for all we know, comes <laughs> and initiates the African-American Islamic tradition and right. at least revives it, yeah. right? It's the, and, and, and maybe revives it is the right word because because obviously, in the book, I also talk about the you know Islamic tradition that's coming on the slave ships. Yeah. So obviously, there is an African American tradition that's, but it really needs to be revived in the 20th century, and it's being yeah. revived through that those contacts. That's right. And it's not just Farad Muhammad; it's also you know the 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 kind of uh, not contract like the the parallel struggles that immigrant communities are escaping like fighting the British call European colonists in Africa and Asia. And they're coming here and finding African Americans struggling for their civil rights against white America at the same time. And this kind of confluence really builds. And so it's really interesting to see that in the, through the early 20th century, I was finding, and this is part of the story is part of the book, but yeah, it, you know, that, the African American Muslim communities and immigrant Muslim communities are really feeding off each other, right? Um, all, and uh, and there's something building. Uh, I mean, of course, there there is. I'm sure there is like you know still tensions, but it wasn't to any level that. It, what really changes it, I think, is the 1965 immigration reforms, where yeah. a majority African American Muslim population suddenly, very quickly, once the quotas are lifted very quickly american islam's face changes from a black face to a a brown face a hundred percent so you yeah. have mm -hmm. and that is a that's a shock to it was just so stark and so quick it happened within like a decade that's right a majority of muslims just went from being african-american to immigrant and and that is really where the tensions start and but throughout this whole period both african-americans Immigrant Muslims are looking back at the Middle East. And remember, the oil, discovery of oil is happening at the same time. So, you know, what's interesting is um, at the same time, I don't know if in the, in the wider public perception, if there's a connection between the black Muslims and the immigrant Muslims, at least just anecdotally on in terms of uh, like what my parents told me it was like being a Muslim in the 70s. There seems to be there seemed to be in the in the public perception, um, not an overlap. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely, I think there's no way to pull these strands apart, really. Um, these, the, Islam, the American Islamic tradition is 
is growing from this uh, contact between uh, immigrant Islam and, and African American. It, it, whatever is, you know, the revival of African American Islam. There's scholars who've done work on this, I think, much better than I could explain. But uh, to me, it's really, you know, the, it's really that, you know, I, even there's a part of the story that's about the 1960s, about how the Black Power movement is coinciding with the 1967 war. In, oh, yeah. In, in, you know, the Middle East and how, uh, you know, black activists in America are taking up Palestinian, the Palestinian cause. And, you know, there's just these, you know, all the way again, it's, and you can move backward through colonial struggle and African-American civil rights struggle. And so you can keep moving forward. And I think that's why, to be honest, South Asian Muslims have, have really been, it played an important role in this uh, interaction or this inter have been like at the front of this interface because of the language, right? Yeah. They, they were well, English subjects. So the, the South Asians like Astor Farad Muhammad and everybody, all South Asians who've come from there came speaking fluent English or very good English. That's and right. so they were really, that is where the, the connection between South Asian Islam specifically and African American Islam is really strong is that For this sure. is the one immigrant group that African American Islamic Muslims had had an, an easy time communicating with, like on a very real level. If you're going to talk to somebody, you have to speak the same language and have some mastery of it. So yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, things change after 1965, obviously, and I think when that's when a lot of the tensions start. That is part of what's happening in this hostage taking in 1977, because remember, it's they took over the B'nai B'rith. Or because Khalas believed, well, there was a lot that he believed about Jews and their role and influence, not just in Hollywood, but also like around the world. He was, you know, he had very, some really anti Semitic views. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, but the second uh, the target, in some ways, the real target, to be honest, was the Islamic Center. He wanted to, specifically, he was after the Imam, Muhammad Abdur Rauf. Uh, who he believed was uh, represented that um, strain of Muslims abroad who were siding with Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam and selling out uh, Sunni Islam in America. And so he was kind of that attack on the Islamic Center was as important, if not more important, in Khalas's mind, because he would, this was an attack on foreign Islam, like Middle Eastern, Asian the foreigners in in the mix, but also it was his um, anger and his, um, yeah, I mean, his anger at immigrant Muslims for so, how they were, you know, this kind of leaning towards Elijah Muhammad, ignoring the Sunni groups in, in the country. So something that comes from, as you say, the very top of this organization, it's well planned out, it's not an... Uh, it's something that's uh, done through, emo you know, an emotional reaction, it's well planned out, What's what's their end game? I mean, what do they really think they can accomplish? I mean, obviously they're going to get in trouble for this, right? Yeah. So, I mean, they have three. Basically, I mean, it was three or four demands, which cut, were evolving through the two days, and I track these demands that are evolving. They have a pretty quickly established a communication setup. There's a negotiation team that's dealing with Callis, basically, who's in the B'nai B'rith. He's led the group that took over the host, took the hostages in B'nai B'rith. But their first demand is obviously a God's film. Muhammad Messenger of God has to be taken down, which it is. So the two o'clock showing, which is the premiere showing in the United States of Muhammad Messenger of God, starts at two, and by two twenty or two thirty, it's it's shut down. So it never goes through. It's never completed. Mm. Uh, he also wanted the film reels removed, which a you know would never happen. But kind of he was seemed satisfied by the film being stopped. Um, his second demand was um, seven hundred and fifty dollars in cash, uh, which was uh, which that story is in the book, but it, it was kind of a symbolic figure for Hollis. Yeah, uh, that pr it was kind of the price of injustice in his mind in the court system, uh, and uh, and that took me a little bit. And you should talk about that out. because yeah. what what ends up happening is that the people like the, the perpetrators of the massacre in nineteen seventy three at the uh, Hanafi headquarters, it's just sort of tied up in the legal system. 
right? There's like a mistrial. Uh, there's right. Oh. Read, yeah, exactly. So they, it's just the 1973 massacre happens, and then for the next four years, the yeah. Hanafis and Khalis and his family are in and out and in and out and in and out of courts. Mm -hmm. uh, just you know, just the usual BS of the court, you know, criminal justice system. But you know, there are yeah, like you said. Or is it's mistrials, retrials, appeals? It's just, and it turns and basically four years on, Gallus's daughter has been on the in the witness stand pretty much nonstop. Four years trying to get the people, all of the men convicted who killed her children and and Gallus's grandchildren and children, and and others. So and you know it basically you know four years on he snaps after a mistrial yeah. in 1976. I think that's where where they plan this attack. They start planning this attack. So anyway, $750 was that symbolic figure that Collis had. Mm -hmm. It was just a figure that he had to pay in court one day. Um, but, and then the third demand is the, um, that the, 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 he wants the murderers, the Nation of Islam men who actually committed the murders to be delivered to him, where he can, you know, execute Allah's justice on them basically and he wants to kill them um so and that morphs then into late at, on the first night into a demand not just for the men actually he kind of forgets about the men he demands that Wallace Muhammad Wallace Muhammad uh who many of your listeners will know of course but was, and we uh, haven't talked about him yet so i think it's yeah. interesting well he's that, Elijah Muhammad, yeah, yeah Elijah Muhammad's son and he has taken over the organization after a Elijah Muhammad's death in 1975. Correct. Uh, Khalis wants, and now he's leading the Nation of Islam, which has become the World Community of Islam and actually has become a Sunni Muslim organization. But the, that's, that's right. almost a, angers. Yeah. yeah, there's a huge sea change happening within that community, which we, we don't have time to talk about. But I mean, uh, other guests, we've certainly you know touched on that, um, and we will continue to yeah. touch on it because Imam Muhammadi Muhammad plays a significant role when we're talking about American Islam. So. Um, yeah. But yeah, so how does, uh, you know, yeah, so he, he demands that, that Wallace... Wallace and Muhammad Ali, who is Wallace's kind of star disciple. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, Muhammad Ali was the Elijah Muhammad, but he completely came on board when Wallace Muhammad turned the nation into a Sunni organization. That's right. And so Muhammad Ali has become Sunni, but Khalis wants them to be delivered to him. Um, and, uh, yeah, so those are, I mean, that's what they're hoping, oh my, to answer your question, that's what they're hoping that they can get in a very, those are the concrete demands that they have. Wow. Right. Wow. Well, well, and, and the act, but the, yeah, the actual demand, I think the actual goal, there was only one, which was Khalis wanted to be recognized. Yeah. Uh, as the single most important leader of American Islam in American Islam, exactly, and he wanted everybody to submit to him, and, and I think he got pretty damn close to that goal too. <laughs> that's right, and I think that's a really important point. Going back to what you said at the very, very outset, which is that these sort of, you know, <laughs> responses from you know Muslims about depictions of the Prophet are usually at the backdrop of something you know bigger. And and are you know are, are are in response to you know other events that are happening. So, in this sense, you know, um, and with the irony here that I find, or the, for me that I find so you know um, ironic, is that 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 movie which uh, does release goes on to become a beloved film to a lot of Muslims the world over. Um, it doesn't have a great box office showing, but 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 in terms of like sort of a cult following among Muslims, oh, yeah. it enjoys that. And and what I also find fascinating is that, you know, to all of Hollis's like problems with, or, you know, assuming there were problems with his depiction of the Prophet in the film, I mean, you know, Akkad goes out of his way to use this sort of quote unquote subjective camera where the Prophet yeah. isn't even shown. No. And you kind of wonder, just in an alternate reality, yeah. what if this movie had released to like millions of people watching it, big box office, and had become like a, a cultural, like a, it well, left its imprint on U.S. movie culture. Right? Well, it does. But it didn't happen. It does eventually release, though. Main, no, it, no, it released, but just in terms, it, it kind of. I bet this incident essentially kind of dampened oh, dampens yeah, yeah. the box office, mm, and yeah. it's essentially yeah. way fewer people True. end Good up point. watching yeah. it. You know, there's so many what ifs that I it, that in this book is just 
it was really, you know, th- this is one what if. It's like, what if this movie had actually gone on? Mm-hmm. Because Akkad was also driven by, you know, the title of the book, The American Caliph. I'm referring to a, a few people's aspirations. Obviously, mm-hmm. Khalis, who's my main character. Then Wallace Muhammad, who definitely had aspirations and, you know, realized becoming the leader of American Muslims in some way. Yeah. But Akkad, the filmmaker, it's like, I make allusions to his kind of, mission as well That's where he's just kind of gone crazy and over 10 years battles just geopolitics and insanity to get this film done because he believes he has a strong belief that he has to deliver the story of islam to america you know something and, you mentioned in one of your talks and, and you're talking to two star wars buffs here so i find it fascinating because again both movies released oh, in 1977 there are <laughs> yes. muhammad messenger of god cost a whopping 17 million dollars to make that's right whereas and star wars go ahead a Sean. new hope what a new hope was 11 million that's what george lucas puts the price <laughs> on. this thing was almost not twice uh, not exactly twice as expensive but i right. mean if you watch the film which a lot of people have oh yeah of course it did i mean there's thousands of extras in some shots yeah thousands of extras there's no special effects this is all just like muscle and these giant epic scenes it's shot all over the world it's edited in the uh, twickenham studios actually in london um where the beatles had done some of their i mean it's just like they were they were paying for top of the lo- shelf like top of yeah. the line right. talent anthony quinn, anthony quinn is an oscar winner right. maurice jar who did the music is oscar winner i mean just like top line talent yeah. so it, of course it was very expensive but and it and it flopped at the box office yeah but there's another what if, you know, another what if that I've thought about is, is Malcolm X. And, mm. and, you know, it's, I don't think, again, I don't think people appreciate talking about actually, like, how does international Islam and immigrant Muslims and Middle Eastern Muslims and South Asian Muslims and black Af- African American Muslims interacting and interfacing. Like, people don't appreciate that Malcolm spent a majority of the last year of his life on this earth abroad Correct. in Africa and the Middle East and in the, you know, with Muslims abroad. Yeah. That is what he was up to in the final year of his life. Most of that year he didn't spend in the U S that's correct. And it was when he returned from his trip to Al Azhar and the Muslim world uh, league in Jeddah in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, like basically he had been anointed the American Caliph. In that trip in 1964, he yeah. they had told basically he had won the favor. He had dethroned Elijah Muhammad because Al Azhar had said, "You are the you are our guy in America." The Muslim World League, which was uh, you know emerging as that time as a very powerful organization in Saudi Arabia, had pretty much said, "You are our guy in America." So he had become the first caliph of American Islam. That's right. And he lands back, and that day. The nation of Islam tells him basically in a in a tele, telegram that we're about to kill you, and he knows, and it takes two weeks before he's gunned down. But that was kind of, I mean, it, the 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 idea of why Malcolm Alex was assassinated, Malik al Shabazz was assassinated, it, is you know we talk about it in a lot of terms, but to me it's very clear that the reason why he was assassinated was because he had become such an important Muslim in America, you know, and the, the struggle for that position was real. And uh, yeah. I think, you know, the Nation of Islam took him out and there were other people really could benefit from him being gone, uh, namely the, you know, the FBI and the security establishment. Yeah. They let him take him out. But that's another what if I was thinking. It's like, that's great. What, yeah. if, what if Malcolm had established himself over the decades that followed as mm-hmm. the leader of American Islam? Right. I mean, and we, there was that cohesion yeah. and that leadership and centralized leadership in American Islam. What would America look like? What, you know, I mean, it's just crazy to think so true. what American Islam would look like. So, so true. And, and we, you know, we've talked about 1965, but I mean, it really becomes a watershed year, not only because of the, you know, the influx of immigrants that start um, after that year, but it's also the year that Malcolm is assassinated in February. And, yeah. So listeners are going to have to buy the book, of course, to get all the details, which are absolutely fascinating, absolutely riveting. 
Um, so this is encouraging the readers to do that, and you'll you'll get the full details. But uh, Sean, I do want to ask about what kind of how this plays out. Uh, what are what happens to the players? How does this get resolved? I I believe there's uh, uh, an, an immigrant kind of uh, factoring into uh, how this gets resolved, and uh, and but walk us through that, and then let's talk a little about the aftermath. Sure. Um, so it is. I mean, as crazy as all the elements of this story are, I think the craziest part is actually how it gets resolved. Um, and basically, I mean, what happens is. On day, by day two, they, they've exhausted pretty much all avenues, and, and it's getting pretty tense because the FBI by that time wanted to just kind of break into this, crash into these locations and try their luck. But it, it, instead, three ambassadors offer their services to the negotiating team and to America, to Carter, through the State Department, and they, they offer to walk in to the B'nai B'rith, which is the main hostage location where Collis is, and sit down with Collis face to face and negotiate an end to the hostage situation. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, it's just insane to think that it's absurd to think that that they would let, in the middle of all of this, they would let three foreign ambassadors. So this was the ambassador from Iran, uh, the Shir Zahidi, who was the last ambassador from Iran to this country. Oh. Um, so, yeah, no, he was the last one. He had to leave. Yeah. Um, and then the um, Pakistani ambassador, Sahabzada Yaqub Khan, and the Egyptian ambassador, uh, Ashraf Gorba. They, those three kind of, well, they were part of the negotiating team, actually, early in the first day. Uh, but they offered on the second evening when things were just about to go blow up, they said, we'll go in. And they did. And, and Carter okayed it. I described the really convoluted process through which Carter was okaying decisions, but Carter did, it went all the way to the top. And uh, the three ambassadors accompanied by an unarmed with the two cops unarmed, and they walked into the B'nai B'rith and sat down with Dallas with a three hour marathon negotiation session, which ended with uh, the release of the hostages but that wasn't the end of the story, because uh, that also ended with Collis walking out of that building and pretty much going into his bed and going to sleep in his home. Wow! Like they let him go. They That's him crazy. Go all that. Yeah, unbelievable. It, not, that is probably that is probably the craziest part of the story, is that <laughs> that he went home that night, second night. He was home before the hostages were home. So how did that, what, what if if you were to summarize why that happened, why that was allowed to happen, what would it be? He, he, he held all the cards. He had 150 on. I mean, to be honest, it's a, again, it's crazy to think, but if they were going to be released, um, if those people were going to come out alive, I think that at that point, again, these decisions were being okayed at the highest level. The Justice Department, the Attorney General, and Carter's White House were all okaying these decisions, along with the face of the negotiation with the police and the FBI. But it really... I mean, it was either this or a, a you know, some kind of team, uh, a tactical team doing the work. And I think, you know, 1977 was a different time. And today it's a no brainer. They would they would go in. Mm -hmm. But I think at that time, this is pre uh, Iran hostage crisis. This is mm. this is you know this is a it's kind of falling in a weird moment in America. Yeah. Pre pre Reagan, the cowboy coming in well, and saying, <laughs> "Yeah, well, I was going to say like speaking of cowboy, I mean, and and I'm not talking about the Chuck Norris movie here, but like the the Delta Force, which is a real thing, yeah, um, starts in the aftermath of all this, like or, or maybe, exactly. maybe not directly related, but it's initiated oh, by yeah. Carter. Oh, it is oh. directly oh. related. There were people." On that negotiation team, who went on to create, like I spoke to and I interviewed oh, the wow. people in the intelligence community who were intelligence community people who were intelligence officers who went on straight from the Hanafi incident to developing the Delta Force, which which whose first operation was in Iran actually to create the right. hostages, but which um, is a disaster. There was a straight line, yeah. and and actually there was a very explicit Carter had an executive order right after the Hanafi siege, in which he names the Hanafi siege. He basically restructured the terrorism bureaucracy. And he said, we need to, like, basically with a presidential memorandum, and he said, we have to build a new bureaucracy to tackle issues like the Hanafi siege in Washington. So it was very explicit that Carter, as soon as this ended, decided, like, all right, we've got to redo this whole thing that we do 
called anti-terrorism. It, so it was really important. Is and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar pretty much completely disassociated, disassociated with Qatar at this point, even prior to this? Even prior to the Kareem and Khalis had started falling out. Um, pretty, I mean, the massacre at the Hanafi Center. It, I mean, Khalis, there was always a question mark over his sanity and his stability and how, you know, but it really, the massacre of his family really made him a very mm-hmm. volatile person and difficult to deal with. And it, it was. Um, but yeah, and, and I think a lot of people kind of started drifting away from Khalis, which drove him even crazier. Yeah. But um, but I mean, but not completely. So all to say that when Khalis walks home, he does have they do go to trial, and it is all obviously in the end he's tried for the crimes and all that. But uh, Kareem was foot that bill, that legal bill, in mm. 1977. Really? Wow. Even oh. though they had a very strained relationship, Kareem. That's was uh, paying for Khalis's defense and perhaps even other Hanafi's defense, but I, I do know that there, you know, he was he was supporting. I mean, so yeah, Kareem's relationship with Khalis was very complicated, and and to the and he doesn't, you know, yeah, it's, you know, I think it's a painful painful chapter in his life. I think so, and I and I find Kareem such an elusive figure. I mean, we've, I mean, you know let alone a, a little outfit like us, we've, we've tried reaching out, but to no avail. Um, during your research, did you try to get a direct interview with Kareem? Oh, yeah. If you're free uh, to talk about that. Well, I don't, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, I did. I did. I plenty. Um, and it's actually in my source, in my notes. I have a pretty detailed note on sources who I spoke to, who I didn't speak to. And Kareem is one person who did not speak to me. Um, I tried for well, five years, probably straight. Uh, various times to see if he would, but he was not willing to speak. Yeah. I did speak to Habiba, his wife, uh, who was also part of the Hanafi community, That's and right. Habiba's daughter, who was also part. She was born while they were living in Washington in the Hanafi house. So they both opened up and were very helpful. And I can't imagine that Kareem didn't know that they were speaking to me. Right. But wow. Kareem fascinating. Himself it, Kareem himself did never did, and I, I had to respect that. I mean, I didn't yeah. obviously at some no, level. He has because he has such a behind. fascinating trajectory. Because you know he's been so. Um, I mean, it's it's on the one hand you can say he's very vocal about him being a Muslim, but on the other hand he's not. You know, he's very, sort of evasive. So it's, it's really I just find him a fascinating figure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and one of the few like from that era, one of the yeah. few black Muslim African American Muslims who didn't go the nation of islam route. exactly like he went straight he just and it wasn't like it wasn't there it was right there but he went he was looking for sunni islam which i think is really kind of yeah it's unusual yeah. for that era for that generation for sure a lot of people took the nation of islam route yeah. including Khalis. yeah so so like you were just to, you, you had mentioned about the trial so i mean short of it is that they're they're, they're tried their um um um, you know, uh, sentenced to, I think, life imprisonment? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. All of them got long sentences, yeah. but that it's not exactly how it yeah. worked out, but yeah. So, but I, what I really want to kind of take the direction, um, you know, Shahan, in the, in the time that we have left with you is, you know, as a journalist, I know that you report on the who, what, when, right, uh, of, of a story. So I'm going to ask you to maybe broaden a little bit beyond that and sort of get to the why. And And the why that I'm really interested in is, you know, why does this story, or in your mind, you know, um, why does this story get forgotten? Like, what is it? That you, I'm, I'm sure you've thought about that. Um, and I think it says something very fascinating about the American psyche. I mean, regardless of where you sort of conclude on that, uh, I think it will open up something very, I think, interesting about the American psyche um, as to why a story like this is forgotten. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a question that uh, I don't know if I have a, a, you know, a complete answer to or the final answer to, but it is something I, I absolutely thought about and struggled with and wrestled with for the whole time that I was writing the book. And since the book's come out, all the, you know, I've done the media and then the book tour and as question, I'm still like, I keep coming back to this question of like how and why was it gotten? Yeah. Um, it is crazy. You know, just it, it is, it, if this were to happen today, 
a it would not be it would, it would not fade uh you know it's like saying in 40 years january 6 people would be like what january 6 2020 what happened i don't know that's so it's true like, the no, parallels you know, are uncanny i mean when yeah, i was reading it of, yeah we haven't talked about yeah. it but you you know yeah. images of january 6 certainly came to mind exactly and uh you know it but we know that's not going to be the case this is like you know forever etched in american history i but, wonder if the fact yeah. that the iran the tehran situation the hostage situation was just a few yeah. years later that almost overshadowed it yeah i, I think i mean well it's yes i think at absolutely the hostage crisis in the Iran hostage crisis has something to do with this explanation. Yeah. You're right. And, and it's interesting, like the, the Hanafi siege of 1977 is actually falling in between smack almost in the middle of two big hostage crises that we are define American national psyche. So true. Which are the Iran hostage crisis and the Munich 1973, which didn't have anything to do with America, but people remember Munich. Right, Steven Spielberg made a movie about Munich. That's right. Uh, and and you know we those are the two hostage crises that we remember. Interestingly, neither one in America, but the one that happened in the heart of the capital in 1977, smack in between these two. Right. In some ways, bigger than deadlier than Munich, but bigger than either one. If we're just looking at hostages. Right, there was like what fifty something in Iran, and there was a yeah. dozen in Munich. This right. was a hundred and fifty Americans, almost all Americans, hmm. almost not hmm. all, but yeah. uh, and the capital with some casual, well, a lot of casualties, some fatalities, but it was forgotten. So why I don't know. I mean, I think <laughs> it's it's an interesting question. You know, it's interesting. There's yeah. also the siege of Mecca. Right? I was just about to say when we we're talking yeah. about 1979, and, and even that's better remembered. In a barely, movie. but yeah. but barely, but but still, you're right. Joe Heyman's yeah. uh, siege, yeah. um, just fascinating there too, because that also is right there in November of 1979. Um, yeah. So yeah. So sorry, I, you, you're exploring like some of the whys again. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, in some ways, I think it's also, it's coming, I think 1979 is where America develops this modern vocabulary for bad Islam, militant Islam, or, mm -hmm. or, or angry Islam, or whatever, or the enemy Islam. Uh, I, the, you know, the Khomeini's face is something people latch onto. It's on Time magazine. It's like, that's the, that's 1979 mm. is when America finally wraps its head around yeah. the threat of islam and how it's the enemy yeah. um and obviously it boils over after and the, after the cold war ends but it's you know but yeah i think in some ways this is all happening and all of this and that's what i talk about in the book is all of this is happening because of american foreign policy decisions in the middle east because of american immigration policies at home because of the Arab oil wealth in, in the Middle East because of the interest that Middle Eastern and, and Asian capitals have in influencing policy in America. Like all of the global dynamics are there, which are leading to the hostage situation in 1977. That's the subject of my book. But Americans don't know that. I mean, at that time, it's, it's, they don't fully understand it. There's no vocabulary to right. talk about American Middle Eastern policy and how it's all tied to what happened in Washington or our, or American Islam and it, the internal dynamics of American Islam and this struggle for leadership in America. There's just no, they don't, people don't know what yeah. this is. Like Islam yeah. for most people in 1977 is still Elijah Muhammad's followers who wear bow ties and suits yeah. and, and that's it. There's no yeah, larger like narrative. big cities. No, there's I mean, no larger narrative, and it doesn't, like you said, fit the fit the sort of broader narrative that gets, um, you know, you know, get, get gets painted over almost every story afterwards, which is the bad Muslim actors targeting innocents, right? Because this is yeah. sort of the quintessentially Muslim story, because it involves almost all the major, you know, characters and events all pertain to Muslims. Right? Exactly. It's, it's a Muslim leader it's the, who's feuding with another Muslim organization and who's trying to stop the release of a, of a film about Muslims, you know, about oh Islam's founder directed by and a the Muslim. Hostage, host, some of the hostages are Muslim. There you go. 
But and, I think it goes back and eventually to eventually the, the good guys, the good guys who ride in are also, also Muslims. Muslim. <laughs> yeah, I think it has like you you hit the nail on the yeah. head in terms of narrative because probably the larger public is looking at the 1977 at almost like a cult event more so than a like, Muslim event. Yeah. Like, hey, this is a random cult or something mm, like that yeah. versus this, these are Muslims that are part of a b- community of, you know, one billion plus at the time. But I'll also say this, though. It's like, I think, I mean, the truth is uh, that I think Muslims have also kind of decided, American Muslims, yeah, have at some level decided to forget about this. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. It was uncomfortable at the time. And I think that America, which is what I'll be honest, part of the like satisfaction for me, like the journalist in me, I, I, what I enjoy more than anything is making people uncomfortable. Right. Like that's why I write. That's what I, that's why I tell stories is to shake things up. It's like that's a nicer way of saying it is to like, I'm wasting my time if I'm like not doing that, you know? And, and, reviving this story i think it's an it is an uncomfortable story even for muslim my muslim audience people reading this it's not fun to like talk about how muhammad ali and malcolm x were on like opposite sides of this thing and yeah. kareem abdul jabbar and muhammad ali were on opposite sides of this in 77 and how like these tensions in islam islamic america and muslim america or you know it's it it's really important stuff to me oh. but i think that american i think that american muslim islam or american muslims have also i think not uh, written the story like you know yeah. or remembered it or or memorialized it in some way for and, sure and all of it and so and i think that in that way it's very satisfying that i have been able to do this is that as uncomfortable as it is, I do think it's important. And I do I do think that this is actually, I do believe this is a good moment for it too. Like I genuinely believe that we are turning a corner right now, like right now, <laughs> at this very moment. I think the post 9-11 trauma is finally, I think, I don't know, this is just me thinking out loud. This is not part of the book, but... I think the post 9-11 trauma, the two decade long nightmare, I feel maybe it's kind of getting in the rear view. In the rear view, yeah. Um, like people are now turning and American Islam is kind of like crawling out from under, from the like crouching defensive posture that it's been in, had to be in very true. for two decades. And I don't know, to write a true crime Muslim true american true crime book at this time and for to take ownership of this story and be like yeah there was a muslim mob in philly and mm-hmm. they were nuts yeah. and and there was this guy hamas abdul khalis who wanted and who was kind of feuding with other muslims to establish supremacy and, and like take ownership of this really rich history and yeah he was a jazz he was a kick-ass jazz musician actually. Mm-hmm. And he was, you know, and that he came from Gary, Indiana. And, yeah. and uh, you know, taking ownership of this complicated story, I think this is, if anything, this is the time to do it. Because I think there is this, we, I think American Islam, Muslims have, finally have, a, a can take a breath. That's that's, a, I don't know. That's no, how no, I feel. I, I, yeah. I think that's a great point. And I think... As a national, like you know, on a national level, I think we're recovering now from the trauma of COVID, and yeah. and and the and, you know, arguably the Trump <laughs> presidency and everything, all the craziness of 2020, including and we can't, you know, I, I think we'd be remiss not to mention. I mean, you're writing this at, in the ba- at the backdrop of like the George Floyd pro- murder and then pro- subsequent Absolutely. protests. So the 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 relationship between Black America and the criminal justice system, which again is a, is a is a, is a factor that plays a role in the story that you're exploring. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, so it's a central issue. Yeah. So how, I guess you're writing this at that backdrop. So I guess final question for you is: What did you feel as though that informed your reading of the story, or? Where did you read modern, like you know, what was happening contemporaneously to you writing it in the, you know, in the from the lens of what happened to Khalas and the Hanafi Muslims? 
Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a, it was, so I signed the contract for this book in the Obama administration. This 2016, like, right? 2016 is, yeah. When I started this book. Right. I found the story. Yeah. Like I'd signed this before the election and yeah, it wasn't just the George Floyd murder and the Black Lives Matter movement. I worked on this through the Muslim ban. There you and go. I work, you know, there was a lot happening. Build the wall, anti-immigration sentiment, like at its peak. Right. Um, but all directed at like, yeah, Muslims, Muslim ban, George Floyd, uh, Black Lives Matter. It's like, yeah, I mean, I was watching America through the pages of this book as I was writing it. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. It mm -hmm. was shaping, mm -hmm. it was shaping the book. Um, it was shaping my understanding of what I was seeing in mm. the history, but also it was kind of shaping my, I was, it was a lens. Like I could use this book to understand some of what was happening around me. I think maybe yeah. it was a luxury to have is that like I was viewing a lot of what was happening around us through the lens of this specific history, which is about the American criminal justice system, which is about. Uh, the place of an African-American man in this country and the frustrations of an African-American man in this country about a Muslim man and like Muslim dynamics and, and uh, the, you know, power plays and all that. I mean, you know, it's about all of this. And, and so, yeah, I think it was, it went both ways. And I, but I do think that, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I just think that there was, there's, uh, there's definitely, echoes right. of uh, of of things that are happening in 77 that were like it just feels like a very contemporary book to me as i was working on it, it didn't feel like i was working on a piece of history it felt very alive yeah. and partly because the people i was talking i mean like i interview i got to interview people over 100 people yeah. who were players in this story they were there in the negotiating room they were there in talking to Khalis, trying to convince him of this and that you know the, hostages I, it is very it's, much right. its history is alive it's yeah. not history these people are alive and around mm -hmm. and I can talk to them well yeah. it's it's not just a, a riveting uh, book but it's actually uh, it's absolutely a very important contribution to the history of um, Islam in America, and it touches on so many, so many different interesting things. I think we could have probably spent a couple more hours just diving into each of those different <laughs> yeah. um, tangents, whether it be, yeah. you know, filmmaking or um, uh, you know the nineties of jazz or the basketball scene or whatever it yeah. is. Uh, so no, we, no, no, but no. we had a great time talking to you. you really and I, I think, I, I think uh, this benefit. was a real treat. Thank oh, good. I, 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 I hope you feel that way. I mean, I, I think you know the. As riveting as your book is, I think it was only matched by how riveting this conversation's been. So thank you so much for that. I know it's really late. You join us from the East Coast, um, you know, in Richmond, Virginia. So um, we'll let you get to bed. But I guess before I let you go, um, any future projects that you want to sort of maybe tease and where can readers or sorry, listeners, um, you know, read more about you and about your work? Uh, Please, we always give it a. We always give our guests a chance to sort of promote any forthcoming, you know, um, works. And and we're and we're actually just scouting for future guests. So <laughs> you tell us something. Yeah. No. yeah. No, I mean, I you could always visit my website, jahanmufti.com, which I have not updated in months. Uh, so, uh, but I'm on Twitter too, off off and on, mostly off. But I am there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I it, I don't know. I mean, I am. Yeah, I am thinking about. Uh, I've been on now. It's been three months. This book has been out three months. Yeah. And kind of. I. I this is. Uh, I've been doing. You know, talking to a lot of. It's a treat to talk to people and and you know, talk about it. But yeah, I'm thinking of maybe next projects. I don't know yet. Sure. I tell you anyway. <laughs> I'm blowing. I, mean, I like the true crime genre. I really do. I think it's a powerful genre. I think it's. Uh, you can slip in a lot into true crime. Um, and you know, people will read it and you learn in the process. And I, I, I think, uh, you know, it is, it's a good, uh, it's a good genre to do the stuff of like explaining who, what, when, where, but also the why and how yeah. sort of things. So, no, so I'm hoping, I think I might, I might try my hand at another, uh, crazy, complicated baby story <laughs> of, of crime. 
we'll, we'll see. I yeah. don't know yet. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, again, you know, I, again, on, on behalf of Omar and myself, I uh, really want to thank you, um, Sean, for taking the time. Um, you know, as listeners, you know, one of the objectives of the podcast has been to shed light on the developing history of Islam in America and truly attempt to capture the American Muslim experience. Um, today's episode sheds that light on yet another chapter of Islam in America, certainly a dark chapter, uh, even as we've argued, a forgotten one. Um, but we hope that you enjoyed and benefited from the episode. We want to thank you again, Sean Mufti, for being our guest for this episode and for more importantly, researching and reporting on the remarkable events of the 1977 siege of Washington, D.C. Um, Shahan's book is available through Farrar, Strauss, and Garreau, um, or fsgbooks.com, certainly through Amazon and booksellers online. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, um, you know, check out your local brick and, brick and mortar booksellers as well. Um, special thanks to our patrons who continue to support the show. If you want to become a monthly patron, please visit patreon.com slash diffusecongruence and sign up. You can email us your feedback and questions at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, leave a star rating, um, a review, wherever you download your favorite podcast. So on behalf of myself and my co-host, Omar Ansari, thank you and catch us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. I'm <laughs>